Gabriel always looked like he had just rolled out of bed. He wore the same dingy drawstring pants he always wore, and I wasn't even sure he owned a shirt. He shoved a handful of popcorn in his mouth and jumped to his feet, throwing a buttery fist in the air. Catch the ball, asshole, he shouted at the muddy diamond below. You know they can't hear you, right? I rubbed a hand over my throbbing forehead and groaned, almost wishing I had stayed home and studied. Almost. The sun was annoyingly bright, and it had sucked up most of the moisture from an early morning rain, creating a sticky humidity that made breathing a chore. The air was heavy with the smell of stale popcorn and cut grass. Josie was going to have an apocalyptic tantrum when she found out that I had pushed off studying to catch a baseball game with Gabriel. Of course, the ball field was conveniently located next to the cemetery where two funerals were about to take place for my last catches of the day. Harvesting low-risk souls was a walk in the graveyard, especially after Grimm's last assignment, hunting down a high-risk replacement soul to keep eternity from deteriorating back into its former wilderness. The chaos that would have ensued, had I failed, would have brought on the Second War of Eternity. And only one man had been looking forward to that. Seth. Now he was on the run. At least, I hoped he was on the run. Most expired gods embraced retirement and puttered around their respective afterlives like favored grandfathers. Seth wouldn't hear of it. But then again, he wasn't exactly favored in his realm. Probably because he made Hitler look like the Easter Bunny. The creep didn't care what happened to eternity or anyone who lived there, and if he couldn't be king, starting a war would be just as amusing. Ah, oh, how could you miss that? Gabriel shook his head, bouncing around his tangle of blonde curls. You're not worth the crusty peanuts between my toes. He grunted and plopped down next to me on the roof of the concession stand. He is human, Gabriel. Well, it shows, he said. I glanced over my shoulder and spied a small and weepy crowd filtering into the cemetery and congregating around the first death hole. I better go get that soul before he's six feet under. And miss the last inning? Are you crazy? I raised an eyebrow. You're shouting at people who can't see you, let alone hear you, and I'm the crazy one. Gabriel flicked his wings and folded his arms. Do what you have to. I'm going to stay here and keep an eye on number three. The home plate's been calling his name all afternoon. Well, number three can't hear that plate any more than he can hear you, Pilgrim. I stood and swept the popcorn off my robe. Someone help! A lady in the bleachers bent over a wheezing elderly man and slugged him on the back hard enough to dislodge a lung. We need a doctor! Gabriel looked up at me. Sure you don't want to stick around and pick up an extra commission later? You don't see another reaper around here, do you? I pulled up the hood of my robe and ducked down, hoping to avoid a confrontation with one of my co-workers. If Wheezy there had a medium-risk soul, another reaper would be showing up any minute to collect it. I didn't want to get caught playing on company coin. Grimm had enough reasons to send me to the proverbial guillotine. He's low risk, I can tell you that right now, Gabriel said. How would you know? I saw him get out of his car. He has a Darwin bumper sticker. Oh. I relaxed a little. If he's a low risk, someone will be assigned to collect him later. Lana. Gabriel dropped his chin and gave me a look that paused somewhere between confusion and frustration. He's right there. Easy money. Not to mention brownie points with Grimm. I scowled at him and tucked a black curl behind my ear. Gabriel was right. I could really use the brownie points, but he didn't have to go and spoil my afternoon by bringing it up. I seriously considered ripping out a handful of his feathers and shoving them in his mouth. I glanced back at the man in the bleachers and inwardly groaned. It had been nearly six months since I'd harvested a soul from a body so freshly deceased. I liked my tidy routine, simply reaching in a coffin and caressing a body that's already been cleaned and dressed and positioned just right, and I hated, hated, hated heart attacks. I could already feel the man's eyes migrating toward the concession stand, ready to seize me with the helpless look of a puppy right before it gets creamed by a bus.